That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective, and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on ReinforceUA.com Dear friends and colleagues uh, in Ukraine and from all the world, I'm Vyacheslav Pogatila and on behalf of Mimki Business School, welcome you on Reinforce UA uh, project. Uh, this project was designed in order to uh, intellectually uh, inspire Ukrainian business community and bring world renowned uh, intellectuals and thinkers uh, to share their opinion about uh, uh, future, about uh, the future which uh, uh, Russia is going to stole from us, but we are going to defend it. Uh, and sharing this opinion is is important part of our project. And uh, up to now, we had uh, a lot of other uh, prominent uh, speakers uh, from all over the world. And today we'll have a very special guest. But before introducing him, uh, I'd like to mention that this project uh, became has become possible uh, due to the general support of Bogdan Havrelishin Family Foundation, um, 50 Thinkers Organization and major uh, management education organization association, AACSB, uh, AMBA, FMD, and CIMAN. Um, I would we have online uh, and we have it, uh, online uh, in simultaneous translation. For those who need uh, to translate uh, to Ukrainian, please use interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. And if you would like to uh, would, would like to ask questions, please use Q and A button rather than chat for these purposes. We have today a little bit some technical uh, problems with uh, with Zoom. Uh, many attendees with are registered on the same name. Uh, please don't worry; uh, you will be able to uh, to participate anyway. And now I'm honored to uh, introduce a distinguished German politician and manager management consultant uh, here, Oliver. Oliver Lukacs, Lukšić, sorry. Uh, Herr Lukšić is renowned for his effective role as a parliamentary state secretary of the Federal Ministry for Digital Affairs and Transport. And he, he has significantly contributed to advancement of logistic and freight transportation, serving as a federal, as a federal government coordinator in this sector. Uh, Herr Lukšić is also the author of numerous publications focused on crucial social uh, issues, including economic crisis and the future of Europe, which makes him today's uh, presentation particularly valuable uh, for uh, participants interested in the deep analysis of contemporary challenges and solutions. It is the first time we have a politicians uh, uh, in our uh, project. Uh, and as uh, Herr Lukšić is the member of the Bundestag, I would like uh, to mention and uh, particularly appreciate the position uh, Germany took uh, in this war uh, and support uh, uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, and that received uh, um, not only military, not only financial, but also uh, cordial uh, support uh, of those immigrants who are located uh, in Germany. Uh, thank you, uh, Herr Lukšić, and in your uh, uh, in your presence for everybody uh, who, who who makes this possible. Uh, the subject of discussion is quite interesting because for a long period, Ukraine uh, economic potential was embedded, was linked inevitably with Ukraine location and infrastructure and logistics were key elements uh, of the growth. Uh, now the situation obviously changed and uh, is changing. Um, and therefore, uh, it is uh, particularly important uh, for us also to understand and to learn how these um, uh, fields, uh, logistics uh, and communications uh, can be developed in the developed country um, uh, like Germany, uh, what actually the future insights uh, and uh, what uh, we will appreciate Herr uh, your uh, your thoughts, insights, and opinions in this subject uh, in particular. Um, we'll have a presentation and then a Q&A se session for, for discussion. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. So dear team of the International Management Institute in Kiev, Mr. Pocotillo, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, thanks again for inviting me to participate in your Reinforce Ukraine webinar. Well, two years ago, Russia started its war of aggression, a lot of terrible destruction 
and yeah, senseless suffering. And yeah, uh, let me say, I have the highest admiration and respect for you and all the people in Ukraine. Um, so in February 2024, uh, the German uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz and President Zelensky signed a German Ukraine Ukrainian security agreement in Berlin and I think this uh, underlines that uh, Germany also stands uh, firmly on the side with Ukraine and yeah so nevertheless unfortunately the Russian aggression goes on but it's also important to think ahead so to think uh, about the rebuilding process already now I think is an important uh, subject so on the one hand, it's about the uh, destroyed infrastructure that must be uh, repaired in the short term and also vital uh, services, healthcare uh, be maintained, uh, but of course, uh, economic, uh, social and ecological impacts of the war must be uh, overcome uh, in the long run. So as one of uh, several measures to support this process, um, the German platform for reconstruction uh, of Ukraine was launched in March uh, 23. And this platform gave also authorities, businesses, members of the scientific uh, community and civil society uh, information they need in order for uh, to reconstruct and on, uh, to help to uh, yeah, connect uh, in between. So uh, I'm asked to have some uh, give some insights about the transport and logistics sector. So um, I will so let me, um, let, let me give me something like 10, 10 to 15 minutes and then we can discuss all the, also all the other issues you might be uh, interested in. Yeah, so Germany has introduced a number of measures to support Ukraine also in the transport and logistics sector. That's also something I was from time to time uh, working on. So in uh, January 2024, we initiated, uh, initiated a legislative proposal for the recognition of the certificates of uh, professional competences of Ukrainian drivers in accordance with the agreement between the EU and Ukraine on the carriage or freight by road. A very technical and a complicated process because as a European legislation, and this must be uh, also uh, implemented in the national law. So um, this is also intended to facilitate the conversion of licenses into EU driving licenses without the holder having to take a driving test. So that's the issue because Ukraine is uh, still a third country. Hope it's uh, going to be uh, soon also near to the European Union. So. Another issue the German government was working on was the exemption for humanitarian transport operations from the HGV toll system that we have in Germany. And we also introduced special exceptions for the carriage of Ukrainian refugees by road and rail, especially in the beginning in, um, uh, of the war, that was a huge logistical uh, challenge because a huge yeah, number of people uh, came, especially uh, to Poland and to Germany, and the train uh, played a big role at, the, at that time. On the other hand, we did also work, and that was also from time to time part in our transport committee in the, in the German parliament, uh, about the export of agricultural goods. So we the, so we have two um, yeah, instruments. On the one hand, the uh, United Nations, so the export by sea, but the European Union played a role with the solidarity lines that uh, has been established, among other things, to reduce the grain price volatility and trying to prevent uh, supply shortages on the world market. Now we've seen... Uh, more the opposite and maybe we talk also later about uh, the farmers and what's going on in the European Union. So in December 23, the European Commission assigned a high level um, understanding with Ukraine to revise the trans the trans-European um, transport network. It's called 10T. So this is about all the big infrastructure projects of the European Union. And yeah, the goal is uh, to improve connections uh, between Ukraine and the European Union. 
So the, the modified 10T maps that reflect the new priorities in the wake of uh, Russia's uh, war of aggression. And what's also then new was the revision of this 10T regulation um, that extends four of nine European corridors also uh, into Ukraine, um, at least to Lviv. So furthermore, a part of re revision of this 10T uh, uh, regulation is the, the railway infrastructure. And of course, one issue, a central issue is the transition to the European standard uh, gauge that is planned. So for Ukraine, there is a joint study with the European Commission and the European Investment Bank regarding a conversion plan, because this will take uh, yeah, a certain time uh, for transition to the standard, standard gauge that is underway. And Ukraine has also been associated with the so-called CEF, that's the Connecting European Facility. That's a program of the European Union, which aims at developing this 10T infrastructure. So the good thing is Ukraine is now eligible to apply for this CEF funding, not only through cooperation with other member states, but also independently. Um, so the required co-financing is covered by the commission. So this is also different. Usually the member state has to do this co-financing. So now we have here a difference. And currently six um, CEF projects involving Ukraine are being implemented with a total of uh, uh, 82.3 million in grants allocated. So, yeah, of course, infrastructure is a kind of prerequisite for freight transport and logistics. And these examples show how important the freight transport and logistics are for a functioning economy. So it doesn't work without. So while the images of infrastructure destroyed by targeted Russian attacks are shocking, uh, the, I think your people's courage and perseverance in confronting this uh, destruction give us a cause for hope and optimism. So an efficient transport infrastructure and high capacity internet connections are the backbone of any kind of uh, transport systems and of course uh, the, the, yeah, the backbone of human mobility and yeah, in Germany we have the privilege to live and work in peace. So any uh, comparison with the situation in Ukraine is uh, inappropriate. So please allow me uh, nevertheless to uh, briefly uh, mention the challenges that we have in Germany in light of the geopolitical, uh, geopolitical situation and the difficulties that we, uh, that we do have with supply chains. Um, so also in Germany, we must ensure that the infrastructure is available, which is an issue in Germany reducing bureaucracy, especially in planning and in implementation. It's a huge issue for the, for the government on all different uh, government levels. Yeah, digital transformation, I think that's a huge issue, especially for the administration in Germany. And of course, not only in Germany, but also within the European Union, uh, supporting the industry in uh, developing sustainable mobility solutions, uh, trying to be as technological neutral as possible. Uh, that's a huge discussion that we have now in Germany, but also in, in the European Union. So just a few numbers and effects on the German transport in infrastructure system. So uh, as you know, the, the geographical situation is the cause that we have much more traffic in Germany than in Southern Europe, in Eastern, Northern or Western Europe, because we are in the heart of the European Union, usually Germany is growing at the moment, not enough, but we do have a lot of trans-European traffic uh, in uh, on all the different infrastructures in the air, on the waterways, on the railroads, but especially also on the road infrastructure. And the thing is that our traffic forecasts and our government has a very precise and yeah, a well elaborated system uh, predicts a significant growth in both freight and passenger transport by 36% uh, in the next 30 years. So that's 
quite a lot and already now the German infrastructure system is under huge pressure. So therefore maintenance upgrading is an issue um, despite the constraints in the budget that we all do also have in Germany, a big debate about the debt ceiling. Um, we try to invest more in railway, road and waterway infrastructure this year. Uh, that was used, a huge uh, discussion because we have augmented the uh, HGV, so the toll for the toll, and then we spend uh, 30% more in the next uh, years. So uh, nevertheless, um, it remains a huge issue because it takes quite a long time to uh, invest in this kind of infrastructure. So please allow me to make short spotlight on those different uh, issues that we face in Germany. So the railway uh, sector is a challenge. So upgrading is, is important also because of climate change and to be in order to become more sustainable. So our goal is to shift more freight on railways and also to have more and more passengers on railways. That's why we will invest 7 billion more uh, this year. And we try to yeah, renovate the, the, the existing infrastructures, especially those corridors that are, are used most because the difference in Germany is that we have different kind of trains operating on the same uh, network from uh, the ECE, so the high speed trains up to uh, freight trains or local trains. And yeah, this is why the German railway system is a little bit overloaded at the moment. We need, we need to invest more in digitalization in order to have more volume on the existing uh, networks. This will cause a lot of infrastructure working. This is yeah a main, a main topic in, in this year. Uh, Nevertheless, roads and especially bridges are a huge issue in Germany. So only on the motorways we have, uh, let, let me think about the number. I think it's 27,000 bridges. Usually you have two bridges, so it's more than 50,000. And we need to uh, repair or build new new bridges in the, up to 2032, we need to do 4,000 bridges, which means 400 a year. Now we are doing a little bit less than 200. So you see investment, especially in, in bridges, it's a huge issue. I think Germany is the first country in Western Europe. Most of the bridges have been built in the 60s. Now we have much more traffic. So there's a huge lack of investment. And so that's a big, big issue in Germany because the high traffic loads in the last decades are getting bigger and bigger. And yeah, in the 60s, no one uh, thought about this. And that's why we have those bottlenecks in uh, building and rebuilding bridges and especially the engineering structures. So that's a huge issue where we're also looking for any kind of, yeah, speeding up the process where we have a lack of manpower, especially in the engineering sector. And yeah, that's a huge point of uh, investment. And I will try later, uh, yeah, what what are, what some of the instruments are uh, in order to uh, yeah, pursue our ambitious goals. Yeah, um, that wasn't that it wasn't that popular. That's why we also have some protests and the in, in, in the sector, but we had we had to reinforce the user pay principle with the heavy goods vehicle toll. So it has been augmented and this will then be spent on the railway and on the road sector. Uh, in Germany, that's a European legislation which gives a certain space to member states. And we have a distance-based uh, HEV toll, which is also technically quite interesting. And this is on all federal motorways and highways. So tolls must be paid for vehicles or combinations uh, exceeding 7.5 tons. And now we will go down to 3.5 tons uh, quite soon. So a lot of revenue and uh, what is new in Germany and other countries will introduce it as well is a CO2 differentiation. European Union has strong standards for uh, for trucks. And yeah, uh, there's also the toll in Germany. 
which increased, uh, which is increased if you have uh, a large CO2 footprint. And yeah, as I said before, the revenue is used for, for infrastructure investment. And as I said before, speeding up planning procedures is the key because we have the money, but we are lacking the people and the procedures are in Germany by far too complicated. So we have some good examples when it took a few years to uh, build a new bridge. But usually if it's a long bridge, let's say over the Rhine, I just was in Leverkusen, it took 10 years to plan and build a bridge. So you have different stages. So this is takes too much time. So we uh, implemented a lot of uh, new regulation to speed it up. I have to say there are also some, uh, yeah, other things you have to have in mind. A lot of the legislation that is valid in Germany is European legislation, which is from time to time not helpful in speeding up procedures. So what we can do in the national law is now has been voted in the German parliament. And that's, I think, is a great point. And what we do also see as an important issue is the potential in digital design construction and operation. So uh, that's why our ministry is introducing something that is called BIM. It's called Building Information and Modeling as a standard in the federal transport sector. This is still in the beginning. It will take some years uh, before being implemented for every new bridge and new infrastructure. But BIM is, is key uh, um, in order to become more efficient in building, but also in operating infrastructure. So we are convinced that this BIM procedure is the emerging technology that will boost productivity in design and in construction. And so we have designed, so that's German bureaucracy, something that's called a BIM Deutschland. So it's a German uh, government institution that plays a key role for the digital transformation of the construction sector. And then we have created a uh, some key access for information, knowledge transfer and exchange of ideas because you have different groups working with these new standards and also different levels of um, government from the national uh, up, up to the local ones. So my ministry is committed to driving the practical application uh, into, uh, into federal transport infrastructure. So, for instance, uh, we have now a twin uh, wheel world laboratory in order, to in order to build a very huge bridge in Hamburg. So, if anyone knows Hamburg, it's the Köbrand uh, Brücke, which is quite famous, which is going to the harbor of, of Hamburg. So, the advantage in building this digital twins lies in the connection between the digital and real world. So, it allows real-time data on the condition and performance of the structure and then to be linked and that's important with virtual models with via sensors so also in yeah maintaining bridges this uh, will will be very important in order to have a better uh, overview uh, on the yeah on the actual status uh, of this infrastructure so uh, analyze this data uh, is is important and this is an issue we are working at the moment. Of course, nothing is working without digital infrastructure. Germany is a little bit uh, yeah, catching up. Uh, digital transformation cannot be achieved without modern fiber optic and mobile communication networks. The availability all over the country is extremely important, also for local business uh, location, especially on the rural parts of Germany. So the goal is to to have, yeah, at the moment we have, uh, I think, 97% coverage with 4G and 90% with 5G. And we try to have 100% as soon as possible. And um, yeah, simplifying procedures uh, in order to build this infrastructure is a key issue that we are working on the moment. One point where Germany is must be, must be better is the data strategy. In Germany, we are from time to time a little bit 
hesitant if it's about data. There's a strong focus on uh, data um, protection, but data is the raw material of the future. So AI doesn't work if you don't have data. So data provision and availability is a huge issue we are working on also in the transport and logistics sector. So yeah, uh, in Germany, we have a very strong uh, role of local governments and public transport. We now introduce a new ticket, which is valid on a national scale. And this allows also to collect data from public transport in order to make it more efficient. It's called Deutschland ticket, so the, the German ticket which has been quite a success and other countries such as France are thinking to copy it. Yeah, so uh, creating um, a data-based value creation, we have a new uh, data strategy. Uh, it combines efficient and public uh, welfare-oriented use of data with data protection. As I said before, that's not always easy, but uh, I think that's uh, yeah necessary uh, to do it. So that's why we promote also innovative mobility strategies and services, because it must be possible to make more and improved uh, travel and transport uh, infrastructure data available on fair terms. Also for startups, that's something we try to do at the moment. And uh, at the European level, we have at the moment a discussion about the Mobility Data Act. And the idea of this Mobility Data Act is to create an appropriate regulatory framework to streamline the national and European regula regulations on mobility data and strengthen the mobility data infrastructure also internationally. So that's still under discussion. It can take some time in, in the European Union, but I think it's important uh, to address it. So another key issue is, of course, that because of the European legislation, car manufacturers have to bring in uh, yeah, electric uh, cars, so battery electric cars, BEFs, um, especially the charging infrastructure is an issue. We still have challenges in Germany. If I look on the European um, uh, yeah, comparison, um, it's not that bad, um, but that's 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 an issue. So uh, especially focus is placed also on uh, the charging infrastructure, but also on sustainable uh, drive trains. Um, yeah, electric mobility is becoming a bigger market. Uh, at the moment, we have 2.4 million uh, cars uh, that are registered that are electric uh, in Germany. Uh, we are trying to have more publicly ac accessible charging points, including fast charging points. And it's also important to make them more digital and intelligent because of the, 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 the challenges we do have then with our electricity networks. That's a huge issue that we yeah, do also have in the German uh, debate at the moment. So yeah, that's a huge rollout that we have all over Germany, I'm working more on the federal uh, motorways, but this is also at the local level a huge issue. And uh, yeah, it's important to uh, become, to have a much more yeah, sustainable way of mobility in the future. And this is especially driven by European legislation for cars, bus and trucks. Yeah, so I hope this is, was an interesting overview, ladies and gentlemen. Let's. I hope it was able to give you some insights into German transport and digital policy. Uh, yeah, I'm now I'm open for any Q&A, also on all the other issues you're interested in. Maybe I can't answer any question. I will try it. So yeah, thank you for your patience. And yeah, now I'm happy to hear your questions. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Herr Lux. Uh, 
You mentioned quite a lot of uh, issues and uh, uh, use the word problem uh, a lot of time, <laughs> which means that uh, all the issues which uh, technically looks uh, simple, but at the same time are very complicated. Um, uh, uh, we have a number of questions under the same name, but it's a probably a technical issue. But before uh, I um, address uh, uh, from the... Uh, from the audience, I would like to structure more or less our discussion. First, let's talk a little bit about probably the most uh, traditional or most uh, the, the oldest uh, way of transportation, like railway. And you mentioned the importance of railway in Germany in particular. And it's electrical, by the way, at the moment. It's sustainable. It meets all the requirements and infrastructure available. Uh, question is, to what extent at the moment uh, German railways are, what capacity of, of, of free capacity of German railways and uh, where to, uh, or how, let me formulate in the following, mean, how to find money to invest uh, and to organize this investment in order to increase this capacity and uh, uh, let's say to make them more sustainable, a more fast uh, moving, uh, um, big uh, amounts of volumes of, of products uh, uh, in Europe. What that, that's, yeah, that's a question. Yep. yep. Yeah. So in the transport committee, that's the issue number one, two, and three, because the Germans love the railway. And uh, at the moment, we do have a lot of challenges because the German railway system is very crowded. That's also because of our geographical situation. And if you look on the map in Germany, you will see that the German uh, network is quite uh, dense. And we do have a lot of transports on the, uh, on the freight side from the northern ports down to, uh, down to the south. So that's one of the main uh, yeah, key, uh, key elements that we have. The east-west uh, transport is important, but it's more on the road. And the problem is, um, yeah, you asked about free capacity. If I look into the heart of Germany, where also the industry is strong, where we do have a lot of big cities. So um, there is no free capacity. No, uh, we, do, we do even have sometimes 110 or 120% uh, trains in the network so more than possible and that's why we do have a lot of delays in the german uh, system um the, the punctuality is very bad at the moment it's only 70 percent so in every discussion about uh, ukraine there's uh, german people are also always laughing because uh, we make comparisons with the train system uh, in ukraine and despite war it seems that it is quite uh, punctual and um, so so the the, the, the German, the, the capacity problem. So there are two things that you can do. On the one hand, you can try to build new railways, which is extremely complicated because of the geography. If you look to Germany and try to build a new railway through Germany, there is no space and there's a lot of public resistance. So in Germany, a lot of people agree in general that we do have to build those railways, but in practice, if it's on the if you ask people in, in, in on the local on the local level, it's not very popular. That's why, of course, we will try to build new railways. But the, the problem is in, in the middle of the net where the where we have most of the traffic, we try to uh, we have a kind of new investment plan. So until now, um infrastructure building uh, infrastructure is uh, being built within the the while the train are operating and now we are stopping the operations for certain corridors and in this time for six months everything is being rebuilt from uh, zero to to 100 so everything will be new uh, in order to have 10 or 20 years no need to do something this is extremely expensive so we are that's why I mentioned this toll that we have increased. So we will invest additionally to the normal budget 31 billion euros in the next um, uh, more than 10 years in the railway sector in order to make it more digital. It's called ECTS. That's a European standard. Um, and that's why we think that we can bring up to 20 to 30% more trains 
in the existing networks without delays if the digital if the the trains are speaking with the infrastructure that's the issue unfortunately uh yeah the railway sector you have mentioned is quite old also technically we are lacking so that's why we have to speed up this uh, digitalization process of the railway uh speed up the 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 uh... The key words probably uh, to to speed up uh, move, 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 moving moving the uh, along the along the railway in particular, and you mentioned also this uh, bureaucracy and long way of making decision and also some limits in the budget. Though I, I checked uh, in 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 German budget uh, infrastructure investment uh, are less than ten percent, much less. I can't remember six to seven percent, something like this, uh, which, which is not much. So, uh, how to overcome these impediments, which are actually caused in in a structure of the governance uh, in a, a, of the developed country? You know how how could the German uh, build? were able to build all this structure, you know, in, in 19th oh. century and the beginning of, of 20th century and rebuild it under the Second World uh, quickly without all these, uh, uh, you know, troubles at the moment to decide 10 years uh, how to uh, to build a new a new, a new bridge on, on the railway. Oh. What need to be done? Because well, it is also important to Ukraine how if we shall yeah. just come com com copy uh, the the german eu eu structure and responsibility how can we then uh, move faster well that's a difficult question because i, sh I shall promote the european standards but uh, european standards in the construction sector makes it from time to time complicated especially because the environmental law is huge and yeah, we have a lot of associations and other ones who have then the right to obstruct certain uh, construction issues. So in the past, I would say it was not a question of money. We did have enough money. We had even some, yeah, some money left over because it wasn't possible to have the right to construct. This, it takes a certain time to get this right to, uh, to have the construction. And then... I would say at the moment because we did or uh, we have this augmentation of the of the toll for trucks which is spent on infrastructure i would say the money is not a problem it's the bureaucratic procedures so digitalization is one element on the other hand we do have we do need to have legal legal issue issues and the third point and that's the critical point if i talk about if our waterways administration with the railway or the deutsche bahn or if I do talk with the German Autobahn, where I'm the head of the supervisory council, the key issue, what we are lacking is manpower because we need critical engineering manpower and we do, we do not have enough of it. So construction issue is a huge opportunity in Germany. Um, it's not only infrastructure, it's also the energy transition. So a lot of, is a lot of investment in the energy uh, infrastructure, but also in the digital infrastructure. So I have a lot of people that are now in the infrastructure, uh, bigger and smaller companies. It's uh, impossible to go bankrupt. <laughs> okay, we, we can probably proceed with Israel, where there are also some questions from our uh, from uh, from participants uh, and also comparison that uh, in China and Japan uh, trains uh, uh, drive uh, much faster than than in Europe uh, and also but but in my opinion it's it, in that or another way it somehow relate to what you have just uh, said uh, how to invest and how to reconstruct and how mm -hmm. to use the modern technology yes. uh, if you allow uh, me to make one yeah, one yeah, remark sure. on China I hear this also quite often in Germany, but now I have to say, okay, that's it has that's we are democracy. Democracy means you have the right to obstruct government plans. So maybe it takes a little bit more time, but that's the way it works. Yeah, Japan, that's right, but Japan is an island. Don't forget this. And Germany is in the middle of the European Union, and everyone is crossing Germany. So it's not fair to compare the the Japanese railway sector with Germany. If you look to the to the map of Japan, you have three big agglomerations and nothing in between. So there you, it's easy to build 
railways for high speed trains. If you look to the map in Germany, it's a little bit more complicated. So that's mm -hmm. that's an argument that we are facing also very often in Germany. Yes, it's right. Japan has, I was just in Japan a few weeks ago, has a, a really great public infrastructure, especially in the railway sector, but it's difficult to compare. Yeah, but, but it's better than Germany, I admit it. Yeah, the, 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 the they're much worse. There are much more worse, much worse examples, you know, on the other side of Atlantic Ocean. So, so yes. we, we can please if you ourselves. Go to the US, the way <laughs> sector is a mess. So it, it depends okay. what you're comparing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's move to, to towards you know trucks and uh, and roads uh, uh, and in particular about the sustainability and uh, uh, and electrical uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, how long, in your opinion, it will take you know to transfer? Uh, uh, or to implement those plans to to you know to get rid uh, or reduce sharply uh, of uh, oil um, as 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 a fuel uh, and uh, transform because it's also a huge investment into infrastructure in particular charging stations etc oh. etc. But what what are actually uh, some kind of a forecast or plan plans? Uh, uh, of Germany to, to do it and how you look well, at the, the that, that's a very challenging issue and uh, yeah at the moment I have a hard task in discussing this with the whole sector the the, 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 the truck manufacturers um, the, the the logistics sector itself which has a very different opinion than the, than the, than the producing uh, the car manufacturers and the truck manufacturers so it's the interesting thing to know is it's not the German reg regulation. It's almost easy the European regulation. So we, the European uh, Parliament and the Council just voted a new uh, regulation on heavy uh, heavy vehicles, and it's similar uh, on cars and buses. So uh, it, it has a certain way how to measure uh, the CO two footprint. That's something. I think should be open to discussion because the, the, the European regulation is foreseeing that battery electric mobility is always green, which is something that might be discussed, but that's at the moment the regulation. And that's why it's go every year the, the manufacturers have to go bring down CO2 emissions for cars, buses, and trucks. And yeah, and it has to be 100% CO2 neutral. That's why the truck manufacturers will or must pay uh, quite heavy uh, um, fees if they don't fulfill the European regulation. But if you ask now the client, so the SME who is driving parts for the German automotive companies from A to B, that's something that is not very popular because they like the diesel truck, which is reliable and cheap but the european regulation does foresee that up in 2030 more than one third has to be either electric or uh, used with uh, h2 or so so that's that's a, a very difficult transition that we are facing because yeah the the, the it's easier we do see electric mobility for instance, um, uh, DHL, so the German Post, that's easy. They are just driving. They have you have small small uh, trucks, only seven point five tons. They have just one hundred fifty two hundred kilometers per day. So also the charging issue is not that huge. It is an issue because if you are asking your local um, energy company uh, that you want to have twenty. Um, 20 infrastructures for high charging that's difficult but it's working but if you do this for 40 ton trucks of course you have the issue with the the range that that is an issue the the, the, the infrastructure is not ready yet but uh, the european legislation does foresee that it has to be implemented so that's a huge issue uh, that we do face and we do have also different economic uh, interests if you look to the manufacturing side, who have to push it, and German manufacturers such as Daimler, uh, Traton, they are happy because they know how to build it, but now the client has to buy it. So the European legislation is not, not always market-oriented, so there's a strong 
push for uh, for those for specific technologies and yeah this transition is it's a huge issue in germany uh, well you used uh, uh, what's uh, a, a huge issue at the same time i must or have to um, uh, let me give you another example which is going on right now uh, at the moment uh, also uh, related to um, uh, european uh, union legislation uh, but also uh, presenting in particular on the borders of Ukraine and Poland, but also if you, let's move from Poland to France, yeah. we have recently farmers uh, who objected and actually uh, uh, governments agreed not to follow European legislation with, the, with respect to green policies in, in agriculture. Uh, 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 will the same happen to uh, to electrical uh, trucks and all this? Uh, yes. All, all this approach, you have a bit, a bit, it will be just, you know, uh, demonstrations um, against yes, them. It, have, it will we, fail. We have, yes. Well, uh, I was studying in France, so you have to know that agricultural uh, sector in France is important. So that's politically a huge issue. But and the the, the the French the, the, the French culture of uh, protest is different than in Germany, so they are very more robust. But okay. nevertheless, we did have uh, just in in the in the last weeks very strong protests in Germany, and I had some very unpleasant uh, conversations with farmers uh, because of their economic pressure that we do have in the in the sector. And all the European, as you mentioned, it's of course. In Germany, we did cut some subsidies for farmers. That was highly uh, unpopular. But the, the, the overall issue is the European uh, policy because we have different pillars of financing uh, the, the European um, uh, agricultural sector. And there have been some cuts and I try to remove it from one pillar to the other. That means, yeah, especially to, to greening um, the agricultural issue, which is very complicated and different uh, farming is different in uh, germany than in ukraine you have better soil huge um, uh, it's um, yeah the, the the weather the climate the soil is different and that's a huge issue also in germany and we did have some protests from farmers and then this we do also have the logistics sector who joined the protest because of all the issues i just mentioned and then, of course, it has been mixed with Ukraine aid and the price of grain. That's an issue for Polish farmers, but it's also an issue in Germany. So that's difficult discussions that you have in your circumscriptions because, yeah, I was also working on the solidarity lanes that I mentioned in order to help to export uh, grains from Ukraine. But that's something that is not very popular in Western Europe. But my less, it, it's it's again coming to the, to the logistics uh, matters rather than uh, uh, cost of uh, uh, growing grain, uh, because most of Ukrainian grains and agriculture, maize and and wheat, etc., is going outside the European Union. It's only a very tiny portion uh, goes inside. So it is not yeah, a matter. Of, it is not a matter price. of the price. Yeah. Well, it is market prices in the yeah. in in Hamburg probably uh, market prices uh, you know on board uh, uh, are down. <laughs> no, no, not that you true. don't have to convince me. I'm a liberal. I like the market <laughs> uh, price system. But if you talk with farmers, they don't like those okay. mechanisms. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Another, we, we have time is, is shrinking. Another material related, which you also mentioned, you know, but it's more or less local city transportation and city, you know, this e scooters, etc. We have absolutely different uh, uh, situation, different approaches and issues. You know, recent development in France, in Paris, actually, uh, which actually was against uh, electrical scooters and, and uh, uh, several restrictions on how to use them from one side, from the other side, it is uh, uh, a, a it is some kind of encouragement of the people in uh, in uh, other northern European countries to to use it. Uh, what what is the crux? What what is the point here? Uh, uh, how would you you would comment on this? What what was the issue? There are different issues. So I think that that's a good question because the first issue from a public policy point of view is the so-called last mile. So what about public yeah. transport? If you take the bus or the train, how to go home? And there the e-scooter is, is a great uh, instrument. So that's why all the 
European uh, cities and national member states liberalized it, but then some problems came up and I do see two problems. So first of all, it's an economic issue. That's not the main issue, but it is an issue also about the whole idea about sharing mobility. Well, I did see a lot of presentations from startups, but also from big German companies investing in the idea of sharing cars and other instruments, but no one gained money with it. So that's something, especially my coalition partner in Germany doesn't want to see. Uh, especially in Germany, people like to own a car. They don't like to share it. It, it. it happens from time to time, but it's also a question of mentality. So from an economic point of view, I, I didn't see anyone who was gaining money in this market. And the, 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 the second point, which was the key why Paris has um, changed uh, uh, the law and was forbidden uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, there was now the the, the 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 change in using e-scooters and we do see the same problem in in berlin that the idea is great that everyone can take the scooter and then leave it anywhere else but in reality people uh, fool scooters uh, in the sand so in the in the river in paris or in in berlin in the water or just leave it anywhere so it's a problem of yeah waste a problem of public space and there is there is a yeah that's the the other side of the coin. So I theoretically it's a great instrument in public transport. In practice, it's a huge issue in cities because people are just yeah. If you don't own something and if you just rent it for a few hours, unfortunately there are some people who just threw it away and let it everywhere on the street. So that's that's an issue in all the European cities. Uh, you mentioned, let's, we have uh, uh, a few minutes. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned that you are liberal. You are uh, also uh, um, having a podcast about about these matters, as far as I know. Um, uh, we, in Ukraine, at least, in my opinion, based on the uh, normal distribution of information, are much better informed about you know political movements and ideological clashes uh, what's going on in the USA uh, uh, than in in uh, in Germany for example or in Netherlands uh, uh, or in France is another pair of shoes so uh, uh, how how would you describe the ideological political situation in Germany for example what is the the, the breaks where are these lines which, which are somehow divide uh, this ideology like you know free democratic party which mm. belongs uh, with uh, mm. this Christian Democrats what they don't agree about what are critical issues they don't yeah. agree about uh, so, if, if for us it's yeah. it's it's interesting to know <laughs> thank you sure so well, I'm less objective on this point. So of course, of course. As, as neutral as possible. Well, first of all, I would like to say, um, in order to understand the political system, you have to know that the voting system is the reason why you have a certain party system and not vice versa. That's something people are mixing up. Everything depends on the voting system. That's why we do have in Germany different parties. And if you have only a, a voting system with circumscriptions and with one, the winner takes it all system, like in the US, you will have only two, two parties. That's different in Germany, where we had historically three parties, center-right Christian Democrats, center-left uh, the Social Democrats, and my party in the middle, in, 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 in the center. Then in the 80s, we had the Greens emerging on the center on the center left uh, as a new party, which is quite strong only in the German speaking uh, countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. It, they are weak in, in other countries. I could make some comments, but uh, I tried to skip it. And now we do have similar problems in Germany than in all the other European countries. What we do see is that the traditional party system is eroding. And we do see new parties coming up, but unfortunately not democratic parties in the center, but especially on the far right. It's the so-called AfD, uh, Alternative for Germany, which is, I call it always Alternative for Russia. They are very pro-Russian. And the same on the left. So we have the German left, it's called Die Linke, the left, which was the former 
party, ruling party in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Eastern Germany. And now they have a new party, which is even more on the left, which is also yeah very populist movement. So this is, yeah, I would say my, 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 my thoughts are we do have the problem all in all the Western countries that yeah everything is becoming more complex is getting faster and faster and then we do have different media uh, systems and we do also have of course uh, yeah foreign interference uh, i'm convinced that we i see it on social media if i do write something i have a lot of comments and there are some russian troll farms and it's not only the us but also germany i'm quite sure that russia is trying to de Stabilize a Western democracy. What we do see is, uh, yeah, uh, a challenge for Western democracies. And there's not only a challenge from abroad, there's also a challenge within the European uh, democracies. And yeah, that's, that's also the, the point in Germany. So yeah, at the moment we have a coalition between the Social Democrats, the Greens and the Liberals. Usually we did more uh, govern with the Christian Democrats, they're in the opposition. And yeah, now we do we will have the European elections in June and also a lot of local elections in Germany. And everyone is expecting that the far right is maybe, especially in Eastern Germany, will become the number one party. So everyone is concerned in Germany. Thank you. Uh, now, I promised you a tough question. Uh, I am I, I, ready to, you know, to ask. <laughs> I checked, you know, this um, uh, GDP of Germany is uh, uh, on the level of 4 trillion uh, um, US dollars or so, or euro, it's more or less the same. And if I would add, you know, UK, France and Italy, those countries which are uh, for Ukraine and support Ukraine uh, uh, very, very much indeed, have a GDP of 12 trillion, which is six times more than uh, than Russia. And now I have this wonderful situation in the USA uh, uh, and 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 lack of uh, ammunition uh, and and uh, in, in Ukraine on the, on the Eastern Front, uh, which can result in quite considerable changes. Uh, you know, the whole history of of Europe can change. Why actually? Why rich countries? Uh, based on the current, you know, situation, and I understand uh, democratic procedures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, cannot ma make decisions about the few hundreds of million uh, uh, U.S. dollars to buy necessary ammunition to protect, actually, in a certain mm -hmm. case themselves. Was the issue? Yeah. I understand Russia, etc. All all these issues, but you know, your young politicians will will will, will be probably, I you know, the the, the councillor uh, of uh, of Germany in the future, uh, etc. And 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 the future depends about these decisions today, and not only in the USA. USA actually is us is is Zionism, etc. Europe will 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 remain. Uh, what needs to be done and how you're could totally be done? right i'm really afraid what will be in the history books if we will look back in a certain time what has been done between uh, 2022 and now i think we are doing not enough it's too late and not enough even the things that are promised are coming too late if I, so i think that that's a huge concern so I think there's an interesting book that has been written like 10 years ago by an American conservative uh, consultant in, in politics, Robert Kagan. I think he was consultant of uh, George W. Bush. He said, well, if you look to the US and to Europe, there, it's, uh, it was called the, the one are from Mars and the other are from uh, Venus. You know, uh, the one are belligerent. They are thinking there's a problem. And the Europeans, they have... I think, especially in Germany, took they have not taken the right resume, the, the right conclusions on our history. Well, the, the problem is we do after 70 years of peace in Western Europe, people think that this is normal, but they have forgotten that this can change quickly. And I think there is a huge difference. And I was studying in France and I know quite well the French politics. 
if you look German media, Ukraine is always one of the top three issues. If you look the French television, it doesn't play any role. If you go in Paris on the street and ask about Ukraine, it doesn't play a role. So that's why you do also see these differences, those stark in Ukraine. Number one, I think the only country which is at the moment doing enough is Poland. They are spending 4% of the GDP to, um, yeah, to defense. And uh, the new foreign minister, Zikorski, has made some interesting statements in the last days about it. Of course, you have the Baltic countries. Because of the history, they do see it very different from Germany. In Eastern Germany, there's a very different political culture to Western Germany. So in Eastern Germany, there's like, like, like a kind of romantic view of the former Soviet empire. So... In Eastern Germany, they are, yeah, they have a different opinion than in Western Germany. So this divide still exists. So that's why the Eastern countries do, in comparison to the GDP, invest more in defense because they feel threatened. Germans don't feel threatened by Russia. I was just seeing American television. I was astonished. That was really unbelievable for me. They have been going to a Trump um, meetings, asking the people, and they said, look, I was seeing the interview with Tucker Carlson, Russia is not a danger for the US, we shall go abroad. That's an old thinking in the US, the iso iso isolationismus, isolationism, to take back from Europe. And in Europe, you have this divide, Eastern European countries spend more. But the Western European countries are also more developed. That's why we have a much more higher social expenditure. If you look to the German budget, we have 470 billion expenditure. If you are discussing to make cuts in social expenditure to have more defense spending, that's not popular in Germany. Eh? So that's the big issue. So it was a really tough That the government already broke up because of this. We have to we have um, we have now uh, 70 billions per year every year uh, aid for Ukraine. Uh, that's quite a lot. So as I've told you before, we had to make cutting subsidies for farmers in all, and, and on the other hand, spending more for Ukraine. So it's right. Germany could do more. I agree. On the other hand, if you look at the total numbers. The US at the moment isn't doing anything. And within the European Union, Germany is by far number one. I'm I'm happy that France is helping with some instruments that Germany is unfortunately so far not doing. But if you compare the numbers from France and Germany, we are doing five to ten times more. Look, the tank discussion, France is not sending tanks, for instance. I agree. I think... I think uh, uh, that's Karol, sorry. Uh, sorry. I'm not in, I, I'm not I'm not in sorry in, I'm not yeah. in position to uh, to ask for additional help or whatever. I but, but I feel like being in position to uh, to say that uh, it is not a matter of democratic votes. If people will be asked, would you like to give uh, your money uh, somewhere else or to support uh, uh, the war, etc.? It is not about voting. It is about leadership as we call it in business as yep. well uh, to, uh, to to elites uh, uh, to make decisions because not all decisions are made uh, based on votes of course the election will come uh, but but the history will judge not yes. based on election but based, that, based that's on why decision we made the decision to to uh, to have now 70 billions per year Yeah, but if you look to the polls in Germany, that's extremely unpopular. We do it nevertheless because it's important. I agree there must be more. And the problem is, um, well, as I've said, there's a huge difference between Nordic countries, Eastern countries, and especially Southern and Western countries. The more you go West, the less people feel concerned. I think that's the problem we do have in the European discussion, if I do see it from a European level. Yeah. 
we don't have time. And uh, uh, well, uh, once again, uh, I appreciate very much your your appearance here. Uh, uh, we believe we are living in a tough time, and therefore some questions we cannot avoid tough questions, etc. And Germany is exactly in the middle in the Europe, and Germany always was. Uh, uh, defined in that or another way, defined the agenda of the European development in different periods differently, but always was uh, was uh, uh, was a key uh, a key player. And uh, it's time, in my opinion, for Germans and German government also to understand they need to play a key role, uh, uh, but not probably um, uh, Americans uh, who are a little bit further uh, and may allow in Alabama, for example, to think mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Russia is far away and not dangerous. So with this, uh, uh, I, I have to, to to finish our this no, to end our discussion, not to finish to end our discussion, and once again to appreciate and to repeat what I uh, what I said at the beginning that. Uh, the Ukraine and Ukrainians really indeed very much sincerely appreciate uh, those helps uh, which were provided to the country and also to individuals uh, uh, and uh, this this help and assistance is going on. Uh, uh, we believe that we are live on the one continent and we shall keep living in one continent and uh, all everybody would like to see it uh, peaceful uh, but uh, at the moment um, it's we need to somehow to, to win this piece that before before it will it will become again stable and uh, uh, all those issues which we discussed today uh, are important but they will come after <laughs> after answering uh, these important uh, and critical questions at the moment i uh, beg my pardon and apologize uh, uh, for people who ask questions, not all the questions were, were answered. Uh, the time is very short for our project. Um, and I'd like also to remind that um, the project continues and we shall meet uh, uh, next month on March, on the set Wednesday of March. Uh, please, everybody, book your calendars and um, uh, check our website uh, uh, for our next guest and discussion. We'll, as always, uh, hopefully will be um, insightful and um, uh, and very important uh, for us uh, and for our future. Uh, uh, Lukšić, uh, once again, wish you all the best. You are you used to be probably one of the youngest politicians in Germany, uh, uh, but uh, I wish you to become the brightest and uh, and uh, uh, and continue uh, your work uh, and promoting these those ideas which you shared with us. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting you in a peaceful cave uh, one day. Uh, and you're always welcome in, in our business school. With this, thank uh, you so thank much. You All the best. See you soon. Take care. And goodbye. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to together. That's why MIM Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective, and discover what changes should the business be ready for, before and after the victory. Every week on ReinforceUA.com